I'm not going to use any view graphs or slides or PowerPoint. I vowed when I left the Pentagon two things. I would never use PowerPoint again, nor would I get up before the paper boy. So uh, anyway. <laughs> All right, now, obviously what we're talking about is important because if you win militarily but you don't handle the reconstruction, you really haven't achieved uh, achieve your objective. So we all know that we need to do it. And another thing that's important is that because of our overwhelming power, people expect us to do it and do it right. I think when the history of Iraq is written, you will find out, and I know the last time I was there and talking to uh, one of uh, Maliki's advisors, you know, the thing is, hey, you guys can go to the moon, you can do all these things. What do you mean you can't get this situation under control and you can't get the power back on and all that? So you have a double problem. One, you need to do it to translate the, the military victory into a stable peace, and the other is people expect you and you don't. That fuels the, the opposition. Now, there obviously are problems to doing what we all need to do. First of all, we need to understand the purpose and the, the ideas behind the all-volunteer military. When we ended conscription in 1973, we built an all-volunteer military on three pillars. One was to have a comparatively small active army. Why? Personnel became expensive after you ended the hidden tax of conscription. And number two, the army uh, the less people they had to recruit, obviously, the higher the standards that they could have. This active army, comparatively small, was to be backed up by a guard and reserve which served as a strategic reserve, not an operational reserve, to drafting people, again, if you had a long, extended war. Now, if you don't want to call these wars in, in Iraq and a long war, as General Abizade said, I don't know what you do. And that's why we make people register. So what has happened, because nobody wants to take that third step, you have a, a, a problem of uh, not enough people, uh, military people, on the ground to stabilize the situation so you can uh, obviously move on to the, the reconstruction. Next problem you have is you have an administration that doesn't think this is important. Remember that when President Bush campaigned uh, in 2000, he derided the Clinton administration for doing this, uh, this type of uh, thing. And basically the message to the rest of the world is, you know, real men fight wars. In other words, we do the cooking, the rest of you can do the dishes. And because of that, this, the, the, uh, the concept in the, in the government, it took it a long while to catch up to where it, it needed to be. And then you also had this uh, ideology of transformation in which uh, Rumsfeld seemed to think that you could win wars and you know, stabilize countries with three men and a small boy. And remember that on the eve of the attacks of 9-11, we were going to get rid of two army divisions. I mean, that was the direction that we were, go that we were going. Now, what I think we need to recognize that is any time, whether it's Iraq or Afghanistan or you're going any place, that when you go in to an environment, uh, even to uh, on a quote unquote humanitarian mission, this can morph into an insurgency. And I think you need to understand that and be prepared from a military point of view uh, to, to, de to deal with that. Now, I'm going to focus mainly on the military, because that's what I know most about, not on the, the other, other, other areas. But in order for the military to do its job, it has got to change its culture as well. I think it was interesting, until recently, we called anything other than a major conventional battle operations other than war. Kind of again, you know, down, down, downplaying, uh, downplaying what this, uh, what this should be. We've got to take another look at the active reserve mix. Chris was talking about the fact that 90% of the civil affairs people are in the, in, in, and not in the active component. That's got to change. You've got to have more of those people in because, as we've seen, it becomes difficult to call up the guard and reserve, and you have concerns about how often you can. Uh, can use them, so you need to put more of these, if you will, peacekeeping and stabilization functions uh, into the uh, into into the uh, active force. Stu mentioned you're gonna have to put money into this. Okay, I mean, if you if you want to do this, and I think you know the when the history 
of this period is, uh, <clears throat> is, is written, we'll find out that, you know, after 2001, we missed a tremendous opportunity to mobilize this country behind the effort. And one of them is the Civilian Reserve Corps. I think Americans in huge numbers would have joined that back in 2001. Well, they talked about it, and still don't have any money in the budget, you know, for, you know, here uh, six years later. Americans would be willing uh, to, to do that, and then they can, you know, be a backup to your, uh, to your, your military reserve. And then uh, you need to also understand that in addition to working with all these civilian agencies, <clears throat> you have to work with other countries. Uh, you know, I've, we're, I've, in looking at Afghanistan, I can't figure out who's in charge, who's getting the aid money, where it's going. Nobody seems. You've got two separate military commands. And you've got, for example, on the eradication policy for the, uh, for the poppies, you've got the Europeans have one. We, we, have a, we have another view. So it's not just working civil military. It's going to be working with, uh, with other nations. All right. Let me uh, conclude with a, with a few, few remarks. We're going to expand the Army and the Marine Corps. That's a good thing. What we have to ensure is we don't replicate what we have now. You need to when, you know, set up, call them peacekeeping and stabilization division, whatever you want to call them, but you're going to have to, have to get, uh, get, that, get that done. Now, when you expand the services, the, particularly the Army, which is the biggest expansion, do not lower your standards. I mean, last year, the Army, in order to meet its recruiting standards, took in 1,600 people who have felony uh, on, their, on their record. You can't do that because these environments that you put people into are very, very demanding. You do need the, be the best and the, uh, and, and, and the brightest. Um, you have to make not only these set up uh, new kinds of uh, forces, but people who join them have to be rewarded in the promotions. Okay, people are going to go where the promotions are. Uh, you know, reading something, you know, about, uh, you know, trying to set up an advisory corps and have people to go over there to train the Iraqi security forces. You saw the story in the paper this morning. People said, well, yeah, but I don't know if that's going to be good for my career. I would want to stay home and command the uh, battalion. It has to be, or you're not going to get the, uh, uh, get the right people. You're going to have to make some hard choices, okay? The budget can't keep going up at the rate that it has, and if you really believe in this, you're going to have to look at some of what I would call the legacy systems from the, uh, from the Cold War in terms of uh, ships designed to fight open ocean warfare or planes designed you know, to take on the next generation of Soviet fighter. Those type of things you're going to have to make uh, some hard choices, and that means that the ground forces are going to have to get a larger share of the of the budget. Now the final thing, you've heard a lot about gold, water, nickels, and we do, yeah, we need it. But you got to remember how gold, water, nickels came. The executive branch fought it. Executive branches don't like to admit they have a problem. And so you're going to need the impetus to come from the legislative branch. And I remember talking to the late uh, Congressman Nichols because I was in the executive branch at the time and I thought it was a good idea. In fact, the, first book I ever wrote was about the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and I found out that they, that they were neither joint nor chief, and, you know, really that you needed to, uh, uh, to, 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 to do something. And I asked him, I said, well, you know, what led you to do this? And he said it was the, the failure to rescue the hostages in Iran, the, the, uh, the, the killing of the, uh, of the Marines in Lebanon, and then, of course, the story which some people claim is apocryphal, but, but so he believed it, as, as did Senator Nunn, about the young man in the Grenada invasion who wanted to get fire support from the Navy, found out this communication system between the Army and the Navy didn't work, so this young man went over to a phone booth and called back to Fort Bragg and asked if they could call the Navy to provide the fire support. So really, I think it's going to, you know, maybe a new administration will not have the same baggage as this administration, admit they, that they haven't done it well. But it's, you need to impress on people the problems that we've spoken about here today so they would be willing to do something like that. Thank you very much. Yeah.